what should we build for an Apple Watch. Your interactions on your wearable is about five seconds. We had no idea what we were going to do. These are actual raw sketches. We've had to answer this question before. Raise of hands in the room. Who's started a conversation like this in the past year? A couple. Who's been asked to participate in a conversation like that in the past year? Who never wants to have this conversation again? <laughs> All right, so a few more. This, this is something that we hear from our partners that we talk about internally all the time. And there, there's a bit of panic, right? Because it's a new technology. But I think what we forget in, in all of the media hype and everything else around a wearable is that we've had to answer this question before, like two years ago, right? All of a sudden, we have voice capability on mobile. Well, what are we going to design for that? We had to answer it even before that. What are we going to do for these weird things that we're all carrying around now, these small computers that give us access to vast arrays of information without sitting at our desks? We've had to do it even before that, too. Were any of us designing when we had to just work with SMS, 140 character text messages? Well, there was a technology hurdle there, too. And we had no idea what we were going to do, but we, we knew that we had to do something because there was a fancy new technology out there. It goes back even further when all of a sudden we weren't chained to our desks anymore, but we still had to carry something heavy and ugly around. And then all the way back to the beginning, right? When all of a sudden we were able to liberate ourselves from actual paper spreadsheets and figure out how we could connect human to human through a big, ugly piece of technology. At least it's ugly now. <laughs> and and the, the, thought that, the thought that Dennis and I would like to pose to the group is that no matter what the last word in this question is, this is actually the wrong question. If we ask the question, what should we build for X technology rather than should we build for this technology? And if we ask ourselves that question and take more of what we'd call an exploratory mindset, then all of a sudden we're opening up room for the idea of possibility. We might be totally wrong. We might spend some time and we're going to figure out how to spend that time at a very low cost. We may spend some time going down a path to figure out if there is something we can build for an Apple Watch and realize that. Our differentiator is maybe not to build anything and let our competitors crowd the market and make a lot of noise. But by giving ourselves the opportunity to, whether we call it fail or whether we call it realize that we don't actually want to build anything for a given technology, all of a sudden we're taking an exploratory mindset. And there, there's a word for this that we've heard a few times today, but I'm actually surprised we haven't heard it as much, and I'm glad. And that's the idea of disruption. Um, Daniela talked about it a little bit before lunch, and, and it, she contextualized it very well. And in this case, we're going to talk about disruption less, less as, as, as a way to break out of your market and more as a, as a set of mindsets and a set of ways of looking at a problem that can drive us towards maybe what the right answer is directionally at the very, very beginning of the design process. And the first part of creating that disruption is having the exploratory mindset to say, maybe there is something we should build for whatever the technology is. Maybe we shouldn't build for the technology at all. And, and being OK with that ambiguity, understanding that that ambiguity is going to be there at the beginning of any design process, no matter how much research you do, no matter how much analysis you do, is, is key to unlocking the possibility for a disruptive idea. So a couple of things that we started to do before we spent a day together coming up with some ideas that eventually, by 5 o'clock, made their way into a couple of prototypes and are now uh, being worked on inside of TIACREF. First, we looked at what are the possibilities that are out in the market. Some of these things are apps today. Some of these were ideas that companies were throwing out there wildly, much the same way that when the iPad first came out, we saw all kinds of crazy ideas for apps, and probably half a dozen of them are still around. So we started to look at what's possible uh, out in the market. And that's where really the second disruptive mindset or disruptive idea comes into play, which is rather than looking at feature sets, as we've talked about all morning, 
what all of these experiences have in common. Uh, Lark, if anyone's familiar with it, down in the lower left. Uber, of course. Some other, uh, some other fitness-based ones up in the top is this idea of humanizing the experience. Rather than doing what a lot of us did and have done and are doing with mobile, which is taking a desktop experience and figuring out how much of it we can cram down into a smaller size, we actually decided to take the approach of how can we, how can we take a piece of technology that is going to be inherently part of the human experience by being on our bodies and start to look at how it can benefit humans rather than how we can reorganize a bunch of features to make something that's mildly palatable to our customers. And then taking it one step further and looking at, OK, beyond the human, how can we really make it important to our customers with the services that we provide to them for retirement, for investing, for banking, and really contextualize it to that human experience. So we started with possibilities. And then we did what a lot of us do when we start these design thinking exercises is to say, what's the market opportunity? In our case, the touchstone for that opportunity is this guy, uh, Jean-Claude Bivet. He is the global head of the Tag Watch company based in Switzerland. And he's great, right? The, the moment that the Apple Watch was announced, they had a press conference the next day. And he basically said, this thing's already obsolete. I don't care. Wait until Silicon Valley comes to Switzerland, and then there's actually going to be something that matters. Right? And so from a market opportunity perspective, he was looking further down the line and saying, yes, people are going to buy this, this piece of technology. Yes, people are going to buy this tool. But you're never going to have the kind of ubiquity that anyone that wears a watch has until you start to deliver on a deeper part of the human experience. And he knows that as a Swiss watchmaker, he's got a chokehold on that part of the experience. And so he's already seeing that there's going to be a need to go beyond just the feature set, the technology, the cool factor, and bring it into something that is much more meaningful and deeper as a part of the human experience. So we look at the market opportunity. What opportunity do we actually have to work with, uh, work with our customers from a TIA craft perspective, from an investment and retirement services perspective, to provide something that's missing in the market? And then we also decided to look at it by another angle, which is often something that we feel strongly is missed. While we talk through this next slide, I'd love for everyone to uh, just hold up, hold up your wrist to your face like you're looking at your watch. Just hold it there. This won't take but four or five minutes. We started to look at the experience opportunity in addition to the market opportunity. What sorts of experiential factors, experiential opportunities haven't been met? Outside of feature set, especially as we get to, again, a wearable, something that's going to be on the body, what's, what's being missed? All right, I'm going to pause there. I see literally one person that still has their wrist up. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe one in the back that's cheating. And, and this is exactly the point. Part of the experience opportunity is that this device isn't there yet from an experience perspective. If I'm going to go through an experience that's even half as long as most experiences I go through on mobile, my arm is going to start to wear out because those muscles aren't developed before I even get halfway through that experience. And so that gave us further design impetus to say the experience opportunity here is to do something that is literally as fast and as short as possible. Because by the time I check, log in and check a balance on my watch, you know, forget it. My arm's already tired. I've had to put it down. I'm disinterested. And so what can we do to really meet the innate, inbuilt human need that's been built up over hundreds of thousands and millions of years and actually serve that through an experience that matters to the TIA Craft customer specifically? So into that, again, all pre-work coming into our work together, we developed a set of design principles, guiding principles for this work. Number one context, and so we've talked a little bit about that. I've got a device on my body in space, much like mobile, but even more personal. We need to be aware of context, and that means we need to take advantage of the, the huge number of sensors that the devices provide. And we also need to be hyper aware of environment, not just, you know, am I near other devices in my house, but 
where am I, what other sort of ambient measures can we take given the device. Number two, we wanted to look at continuity. And continuity of experience gets interesting here, as Dennis is going to show us later. On mobile, that often means, can I start something on the desktop and pick it up and finish it on mobile? Can I start it on mobile and finish it on the desktop? Can I go straight through and purchase an airline ticket or a movie ticket or whatever it is on, on mobile and have that continuity of experience where I start something and I get a reward and I'm incentivized to finish it? Continuity can become different now that I have something that literally travels around with me even more than my mobile phone might. And then lastly, we actually elevated an input or a, P, uh, a part of the hardware makeup of the device to our guiding principles because we felt it was so critical. And that's the element of voice. When we were joking a little earlier about voice and designing for voice, when, when Siri and Cortana and other voice inputs became available for mobile, they were, and they continue to be, sort of secondary, tertiary types of inputs to keyboard and to touch and to gesture. Well, now that we're in the space of a wearable, and in particular the watch, there aren't any keyboards. And there aren't any other true methods of input beyond ambient, uh, ambient measures that the device can take beyond voice. And so until that day that we're all kind of walking around like old Dick Tracy cartoons talking directly into our watches, there's still going to have to be a relationship between us as customers, users, human beings driving input into this device and the idea that voice is going to be the primary way that we do that. So I'm going to turn it over to Dennis for just a moment to start talking us through kind of some of the pre-work they did on the TI Craft side to get us to the place where we could really start to get to the ideas themselves. And so a couple of things that kind of got us started, um, you know, where, what, what do we know already? Okay. And so for TIA Craft, uh, I know on our web properties as well as your mobile properties, there's four key items that our participants always look for. And that is balance history or portfolio balance information. We had change in balance, your uh, PRR or return and we had pending transactions. So we knew that no matter what medium they looked after, whether it was web, mobile, or otherwise, they were looking for this data. And so our initial MVP designs looked something like this. And so you see some notification capability there. You see the ability to get portfolio balance, your transactions, and even the capability to drill down. And frankly, what, it, what we didn't like is that ability to, to drill down and start going down further. Because uh, how, you know, how Dan kind of noted already, your interactions on your wearable is about five seconds. And so that's really what you're doing here. And so when we started trying to ideate through this, we kept that in mind and said, all right, well, this is a good starting point, perhaps, um, and maybe for our MVP candidate, but there are really other use cases that we can kind of hone down um, and kind of define and talk into our product as we launch it, okay? Dan, uh, next slide, please. Yes. And so this is another mock-up that we did uh, for our TIA Direct customers. So we're playing with this idea of our boost reward or our wellness reward. So you spend a certain amount um, and you get some type of reward program back. And so we thought maybe, hey, this was an opportunity in the wearables use case to use this. Again, this is more so on design. We're working on some of that execution right now. But again, you see, you know, we're kind of looking for use cases right now in this space. And this is really early in our ideation phase. Probably a couple of months ago, you're looking at probably around our May, June timeframe. And since then, we have kind of evolved with a partner such as um, Dan here from Effective UI. <clears throat> so this is an interesting slide. Uh, and so we started with ideas, you know, these abstract concepts. And so we wanted to get it to a concrete product. Um, and see, you go through several phases. And no matter where you are in this phase, it's completely fair. Um, for us, we kind of had a strategy. And so when you talk about wearables or mobile or IoT, it really talks about our UX strategy or your omnichannel strategy or customer strategy and things like your mobile strategy. And so uh, wearable is a sliver you know, in that per se. But when we started this journey um, along with Dan, we had a good idea with strategy. We're really in that scope phase. And so we met with them actually a couple of blocks from here and started really working with them in a workshop um, to really bring some structure to it. 
Since then, we've got it, gone into a skeleton phase and uh, to a concrete phase to get it out the door by Q1 of next year. Okay. What's, what's really exciting about this as a model for partnership between UX thought leadership and the business is that the business are, was already bringing to bear, as, as many of us have, strategy and scope and some of that, that structure that drives the traditional ways that we build products institutionally. And this exercise that we did together, which uh, we'll get to in just a moment, to get us to prototype in just one single day, brought forward the idea that as, as I submit an idea, and Dennis submits an idea, and his business partner submits an idea, and our partner Paige from Effective UI submits ideas, that all of a sudden those ideas are not all just surface ideas because we're designers or uh, scope ideas because you know, Dennis is on the business side. Each one of those ideas is a tiny little fragment of maybe a skeleton and maybe part of the surface and maybe part of the strategy. And so to the point uh, that, that Tim made earlier, it's less about kind of the single idea that comes out and more about what we can pull out of those ideas because no, no great idea is ever anyone's first idea. And so this was about us getting as many ideas out as we could on the table to start to kind of build up this structure into something that was strong. Sure, <clears throat> that's accurate. So idea generation, so this was really interesting. And so we went through every single forum and medium that was available to us. So we asked our business leaders or IT leaders um, or UX leads, um, and there was there was actually uh, we have a, a young professionals organization internally in TIA uh, composed of several hundred of millennia generation. Okay, and so I actually got in front of them for 20 minutes, went through what a wearable was, use cases, you know, what are some of the apps out there, etc. Um, and we had some really active discussion in that forum, and followed by a survey that went out and said, hey, please submit your ideas. Um, if you have any. <laughs> and so we got several hundred responses back from that community itself. And so we went through that, mined all that data, and came up with about uh, a dozen use cases that we can further mine. And then we've decided to take that to a smaller workshop and execute in kind of the same fashion that we did with Effective UI to come up with some use cases. You know, a strategy that we took was, here's our MVP candidate, there's a lot of back-end stuff that has to happen as well. You can get that out the door and then augment that um, with some of these compelling use cases as you go forward. Now, Dan kind of um, mentioned this earlier as well. Right now in the market today, you have about 15 plus million smart watch units available right now. Um, that's still at its infancy. You know, Gardner's predicting by 2020, that'll grow to about 130 million. And so there's tremendous opportunity growth. No one's really gotten it right today. So it's completely okay to get out there and fail or not get it right and iterate through this process and come up with something that's really tangible or compelling. In fact, if you guys have a wearable today, probably the most killer app that's out there is really your Maps app. You know what I mean? You know, that's what you're gonna use. Other than that, it's still kind of developing. And that's totally fair to say, you know? One of what's exciting about what Dennis and his team brought to the table, this is actually a literal screenshot from the, the first half of our working session where we just threw every crazy idea we had out there up there. But what, what you see, if, you know, if I'm not mistaken and not missing something on the board, is that there are no features on this board. They're all human-driven stories about a way that we can use a piece of technology to potentially impact uh, the TI Craft participants' life workflow, well-being, satisfaction, etc. So here's, the, here's an actual picture from that workshop. So we came to the table with a couple of use cases that we already defined, and we started honing through those. Now, the personas that were here are our business partners, our business leaders, our IT leaders. We had a couple of UX leads, and of course, Paige, uh, Dan, our agency uh, partners as well. And so the process here um, is really split up in two teams, um, an, you know, an Apple-driven team and an Android-driven driven team. 
and iterate through some of these use cases and go through several rounds and see how it defers. And at the end of the actual exercise or the day, what was really interesting is they took the concept and put it into a prototype and gave it to the other team and try to click through. You know, try to actually work with this product and see if it's intuitive enough. And out of that came a lot of learnings that we took and, and fed into our core product. Okay. We're gonna walk through actually some of the Absolutely. some of the designs themselves, and I think what you're gonna start to see is that the ideas that we came up with at the, in the moment totally less important and and not not really as valuable as the bits that we pulled out of them to construct what we came to at the end and what Dennis and his team are working on now. Exactly. So you know we'll actually go through two specific use cases. There's several several over there. There's several that we have in the hopper as well. Um, but we chose two for the discussion here. One is a traditional one, very familiar that you guys probably know, um, a contact us use case. Okay, You have it on your web property. You probably even have it on your mobile property. Um, I know for us, we have a crap load of 800 numbers when you go to contact us on your, on your web property. When you go to your mobile, you can extend that further by using your, your phone app you know, to actually engage the user. Now, when we went to wearable, we really wanted to push it and see what we can do here. You know, one reoccurring theme I noticed as we went through today was to make it simpler, make it personalized, and, and humanize it. And so this is really what we focused on um, for some of the products, or some of the use cases that you'll see here. And so these are actual raw sketches that you see, so you know, it's a little sloppy at times, maybe hard to read, and so I know the people in the back is really hard to read, so I'll kind of scream out uh, what they've written here. Um, so the contact us, you know, this person um, broke it down to three components. He said, you know, an appointment with Susan. Let's find the closest appointment, best match, open slots. Maybe even uh, reached out to my smartphone. You know, looked at my calendar, found those slots for me, um, and found open slots for me. And so you see that element of context. Mm -hmm that Dan pointed out that's used here and continuity as well. And so and they bang is, two out of three. This is not a designer that drew this. This is not yeah. someone that is well-versed, well-skilled, just came off of drawing 30 wireframes the day before. And yet you can see that when we start from the human perspective, those elements of context continuity yeah. are built in because we're trying to do something human here. Yeah, another one that was really interesting, um, another non-designer, you know, jumped right to voice. Okay, and so you know why even give you know schedule an appointment this traditional aspect of contacting someone? Why can't I just talk to my wearable, and it then contact somebody one somebody for me? And so, which is really interesting, which is really a lack of UI. Um, and another use case was really an extension of the notification. You know, for example, uh, you would get a notification. For example, it would say something like, "You already you made a, a large investment or a large withdrawal lately." Um, if that's not you, call us. It's kind of and your so, basic fraud prevention, yeah, a, et cetera. Yeah, it was a fraud notification. Um, and in wearables, if you guys have one, you know right off the bat, you don't need a wearable app to have a notification. It extends from your mobile app. But what was interesting about this, it had a call to action right off the, right off the bat. And so it would give you this pers personal notification, and it would, you can act on it. And so it was a very, you know, it's a micro case, but it, Again, very apt to this particular scenario. Now, we kind of went over to the Android team, uh, if you will, and the Android team started doing very similar things, okay? Again, right to voice, you know, would you like to speak to an advisor? And what would you like to do? Would you like to schedule a meeting, schedule a call? Um, do you want to talk about enrollments? You know, what is the closest office, et cetera? Um, and they started humanizing it on top of the voice, voice engagement. And so we created this fictitious advisor, you know, just like Siri and um, OK Google, uh, and we kind of named it OK Tia. And so you would say OK Tia, and it was always listening. Uh, in this case, uh, this person was asking the advisor, do I have any fossil fuel investments in my portfolio? Okay. At that point, the wearable app would go and do that investigation and come back to me later with that evidence, you know, which was really interesting, not a traditional contact us path at all. No, know? but something, again, you know, as we look at not only humanizing, but bringing Tia's customer base into it, Tia Craft serves educators, uh, public servants, et cetera, 
you know, folks that are generally highly educated and would not be totally unreasonable for them to want an answer to a question like this at yeah. eight in the morning while they're brewing, brewing coffee. And so being able to go to where, uh, bring the technologies and systems to bear at the customer's level rather than the other way around yeah. was really exciting to explore, I think. Yeah, I was actually talking through a use case at lunch to another gentleman over here about acquisitions. You know, if this acquisition happened, how does that impact me? How does that impact my portfolio? You know, you can see use cases like this developing and your traditional manner of contacting or engaging the company is much different through this, you know, medium. Again, right along the, you know, that humanizing concept, the, the question started getting a little bit more sophisticated. Things like, hey, if I want to get to 20% of my match, you know, how much additional funding do I have to give you every month? It would do the calculation and then come back and say, hey, you have to give an extra 80 bucks a month. And then, you know, not to just dismiss it right there, you give the okay to execute that increase of contribution. You know, and that's what was really fascinating because we identified these use cases, things that there were gaps clearly in the organization, things like enrollment, you know, which was this very complex um, flow, you know, workflow that you have on web um, that we would attempt to bring to mobile and it would maybe reduce from 30 steps to maybe six steps here, and we saw a lot of bailouts, for example, in enrollment. And so a use case was something like, hey, um, we saw that you bailed out. You know, would you like to complete this here? And so within several swipes, if I can complete that, that's a big win for the organization. And so those are the kind of use cases that we looked at. And that personalization, uh, people are automatically started using this in some of these use cases, mm -hmm. which is really interesting. Again, we, went, we did another round on the Apple team, um, and we saw a lot more of this type of interactivity. Um, when, this one was really interesting, uh, where it would engage you, you know, you were silent walking down the sidewalk, it would engage you and say, hey, um, we noticed that uh, you haven't checked in with us in a while. You know, would you like to talk about your portfolio? You know, which is really interesting. And then if you opt to do so, you know, maybe it would make an appointment for you, maybe it would give you further, you know, further information, et cetera. Um, which was an interesting use case. Is anybody, uh, anybody with a wearable or just anybody in the room familiar with uh, an app and experience called Lark? Great, great little app if, if you're interested and you're, you're a wearable person. Uh, it's, it's a fitness and health focused app that does something very similar, which is to basically just randomly start a conversation with you at different points during the day. You know, can kind of tell that you are just in the next room eating lunch and um, you know, it's gonna say, well, hey Dennis, yeah. what are you eating? You know, and, and, and there's this guilt all of a sudden. Yeah. You can't lie, you know, because you're, you're lying to yourself basically. So <laughs> you say, well, I'm eating a bacon double cheeseburger. Mm -hmm. You know, and all of a sudden it can go back and mine the data that you shared earlier in the week and in the month and say, well, Dennis, you really haven't eaten a single vegetable in three weeks. You yeah. should, you should I do like that. Vegetables. You know? yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, in the same way, we can kind of, again, bring that humanizing element to, to an experience like this. And, and hopefully you can start to see, as we go through here, that little elements from all the experiences, both Apple and, uh, and Android, are starting to cross-pollinate. So it's less about, oh, this is the right idea. It was Dennis's idea. It wins. It's the best idea. You know, he wins at the end of the day. More about what little bits, what idea fragments can we pull out of all of this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and toward the, you know, as we go through these rounds, what was really interesting was the use cases started getting a lot more succinct. And so before, you know, you would ask to look at your calendar, you know, and come back and, and give some contextual information. Um, as we went through the sophisticated rounds, the information was already provided for you. And so these are the available times. This is what is looks, you know, this is what's available in your calendar. You know, make it, you know. And so within a swipe or two, you know, that schedule um, was already taken up. One interesting use case was you walk past the TO office and it would tell you, hey, the waiting time for an appointment was five minutes, you know, and it, it alerts you right off the bat, um, which was really interesting. Um, again, you know, you know Events that uh, were relevant to you, so that personalization component um, was very important, apparently, to this use case. And so maybe integration into your Facebook account, some real life events, you had a, a new daughter, you know, maybe you want to start a 529 um, account, you know, do you want to do so? You know, and giving you more personalized content 
um, on your wearable, which was really interesting. This one, <laughs> I bet you this one is by Dan. Yeah, probably. Uh, it looks familiar. <laughs> <laughs> and it, actually, ignore the content itself. What was really interesting about this is the interactions were starting to get very wearable-like. And so before, you would see these verbose screens. Now you actually started seeing swipes. And so do you want to enroll? Do you want e-statements? Do you want to reallocate or redistribute? Swipe, swipe, swipe. I've executed three major tasks that would take me um, minutes in web. And we did it in seconds. And so that was really interesting um, here. And so our second use case, which is a non-traditional use case, I, I would say, and it's our plan yeah. sponsor use case. And a plan sponsor is somebody that administers plans for our institutions. And so they manage things like withdrawals, and they check on things like um, adoption rate. You they know. make sure we're all contributing exactly. as much as we're supposed to. Yeah, things like that. <laughs> and so it was interesting because it was very, a um, lot of data, you know, a lot of insights, you know, dashboardy type stuff, um, and really keeping a person informed. And so you saw a lot of these um, use cases, you know, in start flashing stats, notifications for you. Um, we even had the ability to give you um, withdrawals and that approval. That you know, very quickly, I can look at my watch, do X Y Z approval, and go on my way. You know, I didn't have to be at my desk. I didn't even need to open up my mobile phone. And so these are the types of. Uh, um, designs that we started seeing in that workshop. You know, again, a lot of you know, notifications and call to action. Notifications, call to action. So it was really fascinating as we went through this exercise. Since we're low on time, Dan, let's just go to the last slide, yeah? Yeah, cool. Um, and so I'll kind of wrap up, and we'll, we'll kind of wrap up with one slide which is really interesting. You know, we went through all these use cases, we went through idea generation, you looked in your organization, got something, you mined the data, right? You're here. Right now, what do I do? How do I actually create the product? Right, which is really interesting. And so, in in my in my shoes, you know, I have engineering, and so I can push something out. But I have things that I'm, that's already in my plate, that's already in the pipeline. And so, one thing that I took away from Gardner last year was this concept of bimodal IT. You know, which was really creating a separate group, innovation group, whatever you want to call it, that pushes things like biometrics, wearables, IoT forward. And so. Um, what we did was, in fact, create a small group like this to make traction on wearables. You know, um, along with our front end. You know, what you'll notice is when we went through our MVP candidate, you'll see some basic, you know, items that we can already do. You know, portfolio balance and things like that. that you know, the data that we have, and things that we have to build. Our virtual advisor capability, uh, maybe even our biometric. You know, strengthening that as we transact on our wearable. Um, maybe you want to do another level of authentication via voice. And so a lot of this back end that we don't talk about here, because it's, it's nasty, that has to be mature, <laughs> you know? Uh, well, and we, so, we, sorry, Dennis. Uh, yeah. we, you know, we promised you, or I promised you, a, a third kind of pillar of disruptive thinking at the beginning, and this is really it. Yeah. You know, Dennis is, is demonstrating it right here. It's, it's great for us to have an exploratory mindset it's great for us to come at this from a human perspective and think about what's possible from a human perspective. But those two things are way less great if we don't actually get something out into the market. Sure. And, that's, and that kind of you know, really wraps, wraps the, the, disrupt, the disruptive mindset for us in terms of you know, what, is it, what does it actually mean to get something in the customer's hands. Exactly. And that's pretty much it. You know, open up to questions or discussions, comments. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, that's really yeah. what we dealt with because when we, you know, one of the first slides, you know, that we started with, you know, it was one of our flashier slides. Um, but, you know, when we started looking at what, we, what the data points that we did have and what we wanted to express in wearables, we almost felt like it wasn't enough. You know, I wanted to do more. And so we approached it kind of in a phased approach. It was okay to have this as a starting point, but I can do much more. And so that's where Effective UI really helped us break out of that comfort zone and really explore into the edge scenarios. You know, what else can you really do in this median? You know, because a lot of times in financial services, um, you know, even in our web properties, you log in, very busy, a lot of numbers, right? 
you take this and even in mobile, you can almost take that and put it into mobile and get away with it. In fact, a lot of companies do. In wearables, you just can't anymore. That real estate doesn't exist. So you really do have to leave that comfort zone. And the, you know, the, other, the other bit that I think was really critical for us, you saw that photo, that was, as Dennis mentioned, business folks, technology folks, uh, design folks. And so, you know, maybe one of the ways that you address the scenario that you put forward is bring some non-traditional folks into the conversation, into that face-to-face -face meeting, whether that's customers, whether that's copywriters or frontline associates or people that have never had anything to do, they think, with the design process in to put out ideas. And then I would say really that first step of the process that we showed via the whiteboard and via th those sketches, which by the way, there are about 10 times as many of those from the day. Taking the mindset of quantity, not quality, for the first X number of hours or days is, is really powerful and really valuable because all of a sudden, you know, we can kind of flush the mind a little bit and get everything out there so that we can pick and choose from those ideas and also kind of leave some fertile space for you know, the next great idea. You know, I deal with a lot of projects and patents do come out of some of the projects. And so I wouldn't be surprised if some patents do come out of what we do, you know. Um, but uh, that killer use case, if we do see it in wearable, we don't try to emulate it in, in mobile per se. It'll stay in, in that area. You know, for example, um, one, one use case that we looked at even was for notifications. So notifications is a huge thing in wearables and it kind of comes baked in if you have a, a mobile device. So I don't re you don't really need a wearable app per se, but you, if you have a wearable, you'll get it, okay? But the, the balance was not to annoy our participants, you know, um, to flood them um, with messaging where they would just turn off notifications and then, you know, that gain is gone. And so one idea that we were working with was even, uh, <laughs> even tapping into their health kit and their heartbeat, you know, <laughs> and seeing are they stressed or not. Yeah. And so sending them notifications only when they're not stressed. And so where we see it'll get more traction maybe when you're home, sure. relaxed yeah. versus when you're maybe rushing to catch the train. You know, things like that. But don't steal that one. That one's mine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, thank you. Thank you guys so much.